Hey there, I'm Joey Santos, the online pastor here at Christ Church. Welcome to CC Life Plus. Thank you so much for checking us out. Listen, you probably saw a lot of content here, right? For kids, adults, uh, music, podcast. That's why we created this for you. So listen, go ahead, fill out this form right here because we created this with you in mind so we can connect. It's all about engagement. So we wanna talk with you, we wanna engage with you. We wanna discover about new ways that we can grow together in Christ through technology.
Hey, good morning, Church of the Bar. My name's Dale Reeves. I'm on staff at Christ Church. You might not see me a lot. You've probably read some things I've written. Um, I'm involved with the preaching team with Brad, and uh, sometimes I work on some research with him, and other times I preach. And today, um, he's gone, so you got me. Hey, we started a series last week uh, called Encounters that Brad began, and we're going to continue uh, this week in week two of that series. We're going to talk about a, a guy today who didn't even, ha- even really have a name in the Scripture. Last week, Brad talked about Nathaniel, who had some uh, preconceived ideas and notions about Christ and some prejudices that actually turned out to be false. So hopefully you were able to join us last week with that message. Today we're going to talk about somebody else who had a unique encounter with Jesus, but he doesn't have a name. But, but we're going to think about um, labels and just uh, he, he represents something Um, that maybe all of us can relate to things that maybe we have in our heart or things that we wear on our on our shirts or things that we have in our brains that are kind of labels that define us and he's going to help us as we think about that kind of encounter with Christ today you know it's interesting I I watch a lot of sports I watch a lot of college football and professional football and and you've probably noticed before when somebody scores a touchdown like uh, a week ago Joe Mixon for the Bengals scored five touchdowns Sometimes he'll do, the, he'll do the gritty dance in the end zone, and other times you'll see him do like this. You know, he's, he's showing the name of the Bengals, um, prime time for everybody to see it. Maybe you've seen somebody uh, playing in NCAA basketball, and they, they hit a three-point shot, or they have a master, you know, monster dunk, and, and after they dunk, they look at the camera and go like that. You know, golfers are interesting. They're a little bit more chill. Um, they're not usually as, as out there and, and, and loud and boisterous as other athletes, but you may see a guy sink a, you know, a long putt and win the Masters, and all of a sudden he's like you know, doing that. We often see people you know, show off their, their, uh, their team they play for, whether it's college or professional. They're, they're excited. They may say, hi, Mom, to the camera, and then they, and then they show that. What we never see is you know, the guy that maybe m- throws up an air ball in a basketball game, and he looks at the camera and goes like that. Or the person that, you know, hey, we just, he, he just missed a 35-yard field goal, the kicker did, and, and he lost the Super Bowl. You never see that. Or for you Michigan fans, uh, remember, remember a few years ago when uh, somebody called a timeout, and the team didn't even have any timeouts left, it's a technical foul, and they lost the national championship because of it. After he called that timeout and realized what he'd done, he didn't go like that. See, we, we show off the label, the, the things that we wear on our shirt or whatever, when things are good, when, when, we're, when we're achieving things, not when there's a, a failure. Um, so today we want to talk about sports teams and the labels and things that maybe we wear, and then how that, how that maybe defines who we are as people. So we're going to take our first break right now, and I want you guys at your group to ask yourself this question. What's a name of a sports team that you're always proud to wear? Um, what, what's a name? It could be college. It could be your, your local high school. It could be the pros. But what's the name of a sports team that you often wear gear from to Church of the Bar or other places? And then why are you a big fan of that team? Why are you a big fan of that team? Go ahead and take a few moments and discuss that question.
Okay, I, go, I hope you guys had some good discussion about that, the labels that we wear and the things that you're excited about. Today we want to take a look at an encounter that Jesus had with someone who had a label that was not good. It was something that he encountered early on in his three-year public ministry. We're not told in the gospel what this guy's name was, but he's known for certain distinguishing features, and they're not good. As a matter of fact, there was a lot of prejudice about this guy because of the features that surrounded who he was. And he's simply known as the leper. Now there's, a, there's a, a story later on in the Gospels where Jesus heals ten lepers. If you remember that, ten of them, and a lot of times you hear around Thanksgiving, uh, ten of the guys were healed by Jesus, but one, only one of them came back to thank him out of, out of the ten. We're not going to talk about those lepers today. We're going to talk about the leper that Jesus encounters very, very early on in his ministry. And in order to really talk about leprosy today, most of us have not had close contact with anybody unless you've been to certain areas of India or Pakistan or Bangladesh or certain areas of South America or Asia, you probably haven't encountered it. But in the Bible days, uh, leprosy was a very horrendous, debilitating, and painful skin condition. Uh, we're going to show some pictures right now and just kind of, kind of show the progression of it. The, the first phase was to begin with these red open sores that would become porous and they would cause the victim to not be able to bathe because of the extreme pain. You Here you can see these sores on someone's arm or their leg. And then over time, those sores would deepen, they, they would start to, to ooze, um, and, and because of that, there was, there was a really nasty smell because of the because of the discharge that was coming there, and it, would, and it would actually go below the surface of the skin and cause some serious nerve damage, so that over time, the nerves would, would not even really uh, identify the pain for someone. Uh, there was a guy named Dr. Paul Brand years ago who wrote a book called The Gift of Pain, and he, he worked with lepers. And his whole point was that because of that disease, uh, it would go down to the nerve damage, and so be people would become desensitized to the pain. They could bump into things, and they would actually lose parts of their fingers and their toes, as you can see in this image. Uh, they might hit their hand on something. They might burn themselves on some fire and not even know it. And so not being able to feel, to sense pain is a terrible thing. And then this last slide, uh, look at this poor guy. He's lost his fingers, and you can see even the inside of his eyes. There's major damage to his eyes, to his mucous membranes, and even the lining of the nose. Sorry to show you those pictures, though I could have shown you a lot worse, and you can, can do the research yourself. But it's a disease that we don't hear much about. Someone told me recently that the last leper colony was actually uh, closed in the, in the 90s, in the, in the 1990s, and it was in, actually in the state of Louisiana. So we don't have leper colonies in America anymore, but there are some in other parts of the world. According to the World Health Organization, approximately 208,000 people have leprosy all around the globe particularly in Asia, Africa, South America. And more than half of all new cases of leprosy today are diagnosed in India. But the thing about it in the Bible days, it wasn't just the physical pain, but it was the emotional and the mental pain that went along with us. Um, in, in John chapter 9, we, we hear the story of Jesus meets this person who's, um, who's he's blind. A man was born blind, and, and the people said, Who sinned greatly? You or your parents that you would have this disease. So there was a feeling in the Bible days that if you had this kind of disease like leprosy, you must have done something really, really bad. It, it was not a correct um, theory, but a lot of people thought it, that God was judging them for some particular sin. And so these lepers were considered beyond mercy or hope, and which made their lives even more lonely. Can you imagine if, uh, if you had a spouse or a child, and one day they develop a rash in their arm, and the next thing you know, it, it gets turned into full-blown leprosy. One day they're with you, the next day they can't live with you. Because this disease was so uh, prevalent in those days, it was highly contagious, and so they were quarantined. They weren't allowed to live in the town. They had to live outside. They couldn't meet meals with their friends or their family. And they couldn't live in community. We know we talk all the time, Church of the Bar, about how community begins here and how we're created to live in community with each other. And God doesn't want any of us to live in isolation. The physical pain was hard enough, but the social isolation and the loneliness of the lepers made it horrible. They couldn't hold a job because they couldn't be around other people. So they lived in ex exile and, then, and often had to beg. If they were fortunate to have family and friends, uh, those people might bring them clothing or supplies or money, and they would kind of leave it at a third place 
for them and let them know it was there and then that person would have to come by themselves and gather up that you know the supplies and the food and so they either lived alone or with other lepers and because they couldn't bathe and that there was just such a strong stench you know and so people avoided them now it's interesting in the book of leviticus which uh, probably isn't on your nighttime reading list um, there's two chapters leviticus 13 and 14 that give us some specific details about skin diseases such as leprosy we're just going to read two verses today from leviticus so leviticus 13 45 and 46 it says anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes let their hair be unkempt cover the lower part of their face and cry out unclean unclean as long as they have this disease they remain unclean they must live alone they must live outside the camp see this was the the aids the ebola the black plague the bubonic plague the COVID 19 of their day and there was no vaccine there was no infusion that you could take to help it, it consumed not just one's physical pain but their whole identity so i've got an object lesson i'm doing, sorry why i undress here for you today but uh can you imagine if you'd walked around you had to walk around your whole life with this label this one this isn't a sports team label that you're proud of this is something you're not proud of but the scripture said they had to wear this wherever they would go out and so that people would see that they had leprosy and they would call out unclean and unclean some scholars say that people actually carried rocks in their pockets in, in their robes whatever and, and would throw rocks at these people yelling out unclean so that they wouldn't get anywhere near them so that they wouldn't get that infection and of course that would make the suffering all the worse can you imagine being known by that one thing that defines who you are it describes the fatal flaw in your life which people know you for and you already feel in your core how awful that is but then to hear that from other people maybe some of you have a label maybe that's in your brain today that that's something you haven't been able to get over maybe it's been a, a lifelong struggle for you maybe maybe your word today is a cheat a adulterer divorcee a liar a druggie a stealer especially if you're from pittsburgh a deadbeat felon alcoholic sinner think think about your worst moment your worst sin we're not going to share that with each other today but whatever that is what is that label that satan wants to condemn you with do any of those words that i just mentioned describe what your condition would be like without jesus christ saving you what if you had to walk around with that label all the time? Some of you may have read that book, The Scarlet Letter, like I had to in high school, where Hester Prynne had to walk around wearing that badge of shame, that A, which stood for adulteress. See, without Christ in our lives, every one of us in this room today is unclean. Well, that's not good news, but that's where we have to start. We'll get to the good news. The bad news is, without Christ in our lives, every one of us today in this place are unclean let's pause right now and i want to ask you guys to, in your groups to talk about a second question and here it is what do you think would be the toughest word to wear all the time if you had to wear a label like unclean what's what's the word that you think could would be the though if you had to wear something and people in public would see it all the time what's that one word that you think would be the most awful thing to have to wear around go ahead and talk about that among your group
So I don't know what kind of words you guys came up with besides the ones that I mentioned, but I hope you had some discussion. And, and the good news is we don't have to walk around wearing that label anymore. If you had to walk around your whole life wearing that, letting people know about your uncleanness, wouldn't that be awful before even people would get to even know something about you, that that would just define you? Such was the lot of this leper that we're going to talk about. And it's written in three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we're going we're gonna to begin in Matthew um, chapter 8. You know, the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, which are the three, uh, the three chapters that deal with Jesus' longest recorded sermon. And then the next few chapters in Matthew document ten different miracles be- performed by Christ, which further establish his authority among his people. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8, 1 through 4. Large crowds followed Jesus as he came down from the mountainside, the Sermon on the Mount, and suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, if you are willing, you can heal me and you can make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him, and he said, I am willing, be healed. And immediately the leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus said to him, don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. Now, it's interesting, in the Gospel of Mark, Mark tells us the man with leprosy begged him on his knees. Luke, who was a physician or a doctor, he says in his Gospel, the man was covered with leprosy. In other words, it wasn't just a a mild case. This was a full-blown case. Who knows how many years or even decades the man had had this. He had sores all over his body and probably had lost some, some of his fingers and toes, perhaps other pieces of his, of his face, or maybe had um, leprosy all over his eyes. You, you name it, he had it. And it's interesting, it says he fell on his face before Christ. Can you imagine? Like, he may not have been able to get down on his hands and knees if he didn't have all of his, his toes and his fingers. But he falls face down in the dirt to worship Christ because he's desperate. See, he knew that apart from Jesus' touch, he was in a hopeless condition and doomed for life for this kind of suffering. And he's so desperate, he reaches out for him. Have you ever been desperate enough where you've fallen on your knees for Christ to save you from something? I'm sure some of us in this room have. Some of you may have prayed that prayer, a prayer of desperation, and God immediately answered your prayer. You may have said, you, God, are the God of all gods. You're the Lord of all lords. You have all the power. You have the power to heal me. I'm asking you, God, to heal me. I know that you don't have to. You can do it. But God, I'm desperate enough to beg you for that. If you are willing, you can make me clean. You know, it's interesting when you talk about healing. I I know people that have prayed that prayer, and God's instantly delivered them from something. More times than not, however, I think in our lives, whether it's some kind of emotional or mental healing, it's, it's a longer process. God uses medicine sometimes, and he uses other people in counseling, and, and maybe some of you have been involved in that kind of healing restorative process. It hasn't become an immediate instantaneous thing like Jesus touches the leper here, but it's nevertheless healing over the long term. God can heal either way. How long do you think it had been since this guy had been physically touched? Long time. You know, the power of touch is is so important in our lives. He was used to people running from him, not running toward him. And it's interesting, most scholars believe that he didn't expect Jesus to actually touch him because um, that was something that didn't, didn't happen. He wasn't expecting it. The religious leaders of the day had actually added a rule that said that you could not touch someone with leprosy or you would be ceremonial, ritually, religiously unclean it was their rule it wasn't jesus rule and jesus basically said this guy needs not just a word but he needs a physical touch it's amazing the power touch isn't it you know some of you have probably maybe read a book about the five love languages and one of my love languages is touch when i had covid uh, last march Man, it was awful because I had to be isolated. I wasn't able to physically be with people. And when, when we as a church for a couple years in a row weren't able to kind of hug people, we had to wear masks and, you know, I had, we had a fist bump and elbow bump. I hated it because I'm a hugger. I'm an extrovert. I like to be with people. As a matter of fact, my mom used to tell me that in kindergarten, um, 
I will never forget that my kindergarten teacher said he's a good, good kid to have in class, but she wrote on the very bottom of my little report card in kindergarten, if you, if you get a report card, she wrote down, cannot keep his hands to himself. Still kind of that way. And uh, people laugh at church all the time. My wife's always like, you're in people's space. Don't you, don't you understand that? I don't have any spatial issues. I think other people do. But I think we all are, you know, we, ne- we need the power of touch. I mean, we do. It's, it's been documented um, from doctors and child psychologists that babies without that caress, you know, they're not going to mature. They're not going to grow. Kids that are in, a, in, in orphanages that don't have that, that loving embrace, they develop much more slowly. God knows that all of us need physical touch, and we need to be with each other, not be in isolation. So what's Jesus do? He touches this guy. Let's look at Luke's account. Jesus reached out and touched him, and he said, I am willing, be healed. And instantly, immediately, the leprosy disappeared. I don't know how that happened. If his digits in his toes and his fingers came back, um, but it would have been amazing to watch that. But they immediately disappear. Jesus instructs him not to tell anyone what had happened, and he said, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. See, the good news today is that with Christ's touch in our lives, we can all be clean. Without his touch, we're unclean. With his touch, we can be clean. I want to pause right now and ask you guys to discuss another question among your groups. And it's simply this. Why do you think Jesus chose to touch some people and heal them, but not others? Why do you think Jesus chose to touch some people and heal them, but not others? And then a follow-up, is that the same today when we talk about healing? So You may spend a little time digging into this one. Um, Is it still the same today? Why did Jesus touch and heal certain people and others he didn't? Go ahead and talk about that.
That may be something you guys want to dig into a little bit more. I know you've been meeting during the middle of the week. That might be something you could dig into a little bit this coming week. The point is Jesus touches those who are unclean. That's what he does. As a matter of fact, all throughout his ministry, why does he get in trouble? Because he's hanging out with those that are sinners, those that are unclean. Tax collectors, prostitutes, um, the outcasts of society. Jesus eats with sinners, and the Pharisees don't like it. Jesus said they're the ones that need a doctor, those that know they're sick. It's interesting, in Mark's gospel, we're told that Jesus was filled with compassion for the man that he healed. The Greek word for compassion there really means guts. It's the inner parts, the inner organs. Jesus had a deep inner yearning for this man. It came from the bottom of his heart, and it was the very core of who Christ was. And he wants us to be the same way to other people, compassionate. It's interesting, after healing the man, instantly Jesus tells him to go obey what is commanded in the Old Testament by showing himself to a priest. And uh, you probably, most of you probably haven't read Leviticus chapter 14, so I'll give you a kind of a summary of what was supposed to happen. They would have to, the person that, that was being cleansed of leprosy would have to go to the priest who was kind of the health officer, and he would have to take an offering. Two live birds, two live clean birds. One of the birds was killed in, a, in water over a clay pot, and then the second bird was dipped in the blood of the dead bird, and that was sprinkled seven times over the cleansed person. Then the live bird was released, showing that through the shedding of blood, sins would be forgiven. The bird that was killed represented purification by sacrifice, while the bird set free represented new freedom after a life of isolation and quarantine. And it's interesting. We know that as we get to the Christmas story here in a month or so, Mary and Joseph, when they take Jesus to the temple on the eighth day to be circumcised, they have to take an offering. And it's interesting, they take two turtle doves, the scripture says, because that was the, that was the offering that those that didn't have as much were, were, to, were to bring. That's this very same offering that the leper has to bring to the priest. So he brings these two birds, one is killed, one is released. Then after bathing with water, the scripture says the leper had to shave off all of his hair for cleanliness. Remember, he hadn't taken a bath in a long time. And then he would become ceremonial clean. Then on the eighth day, he was to bring two male ewe lambs, one ewe lamb a year old without spot or defect, along with flour and oil for a grain offering. One of the male lambs was slaughtered for guilt offering, and then the priest would do something very interesting. He would take the blood from the lamb and put it on the lobe of his right ear, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of the right foot of the one to be cleansed. The right ear the right hand, the big toe. Now, if you're left-handed, I don't know what to tell you because uh, they specifically did this on the right hand and the right toe and the right ear. What do you think that all means? Well, we don't know exactly, except God was saying, do it exactly this way. Obey what I'm telling you to do in the law. One scholar says this, I like this. He's saying, you belong to God, now you're free. So listen to him, serve him with your hands and walk in his ways. I like that. And then the priest would take the sacrifice of the lamb as a sin offering, and then the third one would be the burnt offering. Of course, all of this foreshadows exactly what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. He's the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the perfect, spotless, sinless lamb of God. And he represents all these sacrifices that were brought to him. That's how Jesus would take us from being unclean to clean and it's interesting at the very end of this he tells the man to to not tell anybody about it mark tells us the man did just the opposite he ran and told everybody i mean can you imagine if your whole life you've been a leper and now you're cleansed of course you're going to tell everybody and jesus did this because it was it was becoming more and more crowded around him he needed time to be alone with the father the scripture tells us you know it's interesting when we go on trips my wife and i we like to go to national parks and we just recently went to West Virginia, the Gorge Bridge over there, the newest national park. We're getting ready to leave that morning. Our car's not clean. And I was like, so? She said, well, I said, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's going to rain today, and there's probably going to be bugs all over the windshield. But my wife's like, I still like to start out in a clean car. I mean, have you ever been on vacation? You look, and you're pointing. I mean, you can tell their car's clean, right? Who, who cares, right? But it's, it's sort of like, you know, that clean car is what God does for us. There's a difference between a soft touch and a touchless car wash. And in, in a touchless car wash, nothing actually comes in contact with your car, right? There's no, there's no uh, brushes or cloths or anything. It's, it's, 
it, it, it doesn't touch the car. But we need a deep cleaning, a deep cleaning car wash ourselves. Isaiah says this, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We are shrivel up like a leaf, like the wind, our, our sins sweep us away. So let me ask you real, real simply, it's not, it's, it's not a simple question, it's a little deeper question, but let me just ask you this, what do you need Jesus to wash you from today? What do you need Jesus to wash you from today? And Jesus had a discussion with the religious leaders of the day of things that make you clean and unclean, and he said this in Matthew 15, what goes into someone's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body, but the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and those things make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean, but eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. Mother Teresa worked with um, people in India, the destitute, the dying, and she went and spent a lot of time with lepers. She went right into their colonies. She wasn't afraid of that, and she established clinics for them. But she even said this, the biggest disease today is not leprosy or tuberculosis, but rather the feeling of being unwanted. Wow. You ever feel unwanted? You ever feel like that leper? Or do you have people in your life that feel unwanted because of maybe some sins in their past or some uncleanness? You know, think, think about it. When we're, when we're in this, we live in kind of one big leper colony, one big cesspool of sin, if you think about it. And here's the thing about it. When you're around that smell and that stench and the squalor and the stain of sin all the time, we kind of become accustomed to it, don't we? We, be, we kind of get used to it. We accept it. We become desensitized to that because we're we're in this big leper colony that we call sin, and the only thing that can clean us is Jesus Christ. He tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to cleanse us, to clean us from all unrighteousness and to make us clean and pure before him. You know, it's interesting. You guys probably know duct tape solves everything, doesn't it? I'm just going to cover up a couple letters here. It's interesting when I have, a, I have an older brother and he used to, he used to hold me down. I don't know if you ever, ever happened to you when you were little. He'd hold me down and put his, uh, put his legs on my arms and act like he was going to spit on me. Anybody ever have that happen to me? And what did I have to say to get out of it? Uncle, uncle, you're, you're the best brother in the world. You're the king. You're the authority. I, I, I submit to you, uncle. And then he would let me out. It's interesting, right, when we're talking about submitting to to God, he's not holding us down over us and he's not spitting on us. But he wants us to submit ourselves to him and say, I can't do this on my own. Whatever the sin, the uncleanness in my life is, I can't do it on my own. I'm saying uncle to you. And of course, duct tape can help things, but Jesus heals everything. Jesus says, because of my blood shed for you on the cross, you don't have to be unclean anymore. You can be clean. Let me ask you one more question as you guys go back to your groups right now. And let me just have you talk about this among yourselves. Do you believe that you're clean before God? Today, do you believe that you're clean before God? And if not, what would it take for you to feel clean before him? What would it take for you to feel clean before him? Go ahead and talk about that.
So here we are. We're in this condition without Christ where we might feel unclean. And today you may have come into Church of the Bar, maybe you've been coming for a while, and you know you need this desperately, but maybe there's still something gnawing at you. I don't know. Or maybe, maybe you've done what many other people have done, even in the river there, been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the ultimate symbol. That's one of the reasons we baptize for immersion here at this church is because it's such a great symbol of Jesus washing away all of our impurities, all of our uncleanness. And when we're baptized in Him, we know that the Scripture says that takes care of our past, our present, our future sins if we claim Jesus' lordship over our lives. If His blood has been shed for us personally and we've been washed in His name, we can be clean. That's the great news today. So I don't know what action steps you need to take further from here in terms of talking with other people at the bar, talking with the leaders there, but I want to encourage you to not walk away today feeling unclean without bringing whatever it is before the throne of God that he wants to deal with. Let's pray. God, we, we recognize and confess to you today that every single one of us without the blood of Jesus Christ over us are unclean. God, we've all done things that we're ashamed of. Um, we, we know that. That, that's just the fact of life. That's the fact of the fall of man. That's just the fact of the sin and temptations that we deal with. But God, we come to you today and we give you thanks for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we celebrate every week during communion. We give you praise for the sacrifice of Christ, for the blood of Jesus, the perfect, sinless Lamb of God that can take us from being unclean to clean. And God, thanks for that good news today. Thank you for this reminder from your word that there's there's nothing we could ever go through that would be any worse than being a leper having to live with that that condition our whole life and we know god that we don't have to walk that way spiritually that you can make us clean and we give you thanks for that today lord in christ's name we pray amen